I'm not interested in reality at all. Um, in fact, I am interested in how I can make the unreal with a tool that's meant to capture reality. Um, I, uh, I'd like to make the world unrecognizable. And so I distort light and I distort perspective with my work. These are all just little previews of a body, bodies of work that I will be showing later. So that's why I'm not really explaining what you're seeing yet. Um, I like to think of my work as kind of this intermediary point. It's not, um, it's not fully unreal because it's still a photograph. It's still based in some kind of reality, but it's not, um, but it's not re a representative of the world we see. And it feels like this sort of portal space or this opening in between our experienced world and sort of a like supernatural or spiritual world. So I got into photography during a time when, um, during the transition between uh, film and digital photography. And so people were offloading tons of gear and um, used equipment was incredibly accessible and cheap. And so I got my hands on a bunch of old stuff and started messing with it and seeing what could be done by taking things apart or breaking it on purpose. And, um, and so to me, photography has always been about, not just about what is in front of the lens, but what the camera does to what's in, to what's in front of it. And so I ended up building my own lens for my camera. And um, I've never given a talk where I actually show this thing because I feel like it's, so you're all uh, very privileged uh, with this uh, new information, but um, this is my lens. This is my very special magic lens. And it is made of nine different pieces of glass. It has a bunch of weird connector rings, a cheap fish eye, novelty fish eye lens at the end. It has two places where, two different places where it focuses. Um, you can adjust the aperture both in lens and in the, in the body of the camera. It's basically a super weird macro lens that distorts light and um, can, if you're a photographer or you know photography, it goes down to F0. So it has an incredibly shallow depth of field. And it's very weird. Um, and this is a tool I use pretty much exclusively for my work. Uh, it, um, it has, it's always revealing something new to me. I've been working with it for almost 10 years now, and I'm finding new ways to work with it all the time. So with that, I'm going to show you some work. You'll kind of see how it's been evolving the past three or four years. Um, and uh, I'll start with some work that I made right before I left for Pittsburgh. And this is a body of work called Spaceways. Uh, it's named after um, uh, Sun Ra Song. And I was really interested in trying to create images that looked like they were of deep space. But these are not of deep space. In fact, they are light coming through quartz crystals. Like, you, you, I know you can only see my little preview, but like, here's one that I photographed. And um, I was really excited by the fact that I could create these images that looked like outer space from things that came out of the earth. And uh, I was living in the Bay Area at the time and, uh, and new age shops are plentiful out there. And I was going around buying these crystals that were, um, that were kind of being sold as these tools to help you align with your higher vibration. And I was finding these things inside of it. And okay, so, so the crystal I just held up, like this is, this is the image I got from it. This is what my lens does to things. It's so exciting to see this in camera too, it, um, to kind of know the reality that's in front of it and then to see this inside is, is a, a really amazing experience. So outer space has always been something that's been uh, very, very important to me. Uh, it's, I grew up in the country, grew up on a farm. Uh, the night sky was a very prominent aspect of kind of the environment in which I grew up in. It was very dark at night, um, but also it was like a thing I did with my family, particularly my dad. We would often go out and watch meteor showers. He had a really big telescope. We'd lug it out to the yard and look at, like I have a very vivid memory of looking at the moon and looking at Saturn with my dad um, and how that, and I really have always enjoyed the feeling of being very small in comparison to um, the stars. And so I was trying to capture that feeling too. In all of my work, I really like to play with scale and, and to kind of have things be unclear as to how big we are compared to what we're seeing. Um, something that's really interesting to me about this lens too is that, um, so this, because this isn't happening necessarily right in front of my lens. It's something that I can't see with my eye, 
but it's something that the camera sees. And that works similarly as kind of as, as analogous to deep space photography because um, a lot of the images we see that are like the super famous images of nebula or galaxies, they're often not um, actually of the visible spectra. These like swirling colors and stuff are um, often X-rays or gamma rays um, that we don't, we couldn't see even if we were out there. And, but these cameras that are in outer space can. And so I like this um, connection between my lens and this very lo-fi way that it's seeing things that I can't and these um, very elevated ones. So this has kind of been my palette for a long time too. I work in color, but there's like usually big fields of darkness in it. Let's see, I think I'm getting to the end of these. Yeah. So this is a different type of quartz. Most of these have been clear quartz that I'm photographing, but this one is um, called rutilated quartz or angel hair quartz. It's supposed to uh, help you do like connect with uh, higher beings. I really liked like kind of having this juxtaposition of like these stones that were maybe, you know, uh, people kind of put this power into them and uh, that they were literally helping me like kind of find new worlds. So here's a here's an example of um, how I would ideally like to print all of my photos is this large. Um, this was at an exhibition in San Francisco and uh, uh, it is so phenomenal to experience the work this large, to have it kind of enc fully encompass the body. This was 12 by eight feet. Um, it was basically on an entire movable wall in the gallery. So then, uh, then I made the transition, I moved to Pittsburgh. And during that time, I was also wrapping up um, a two year long project that I had started in the Bay Area and finished up here um, called the Radiant Threshold, which is an Oracle deck that I, uh, that which is similar to tarot in that you use it, you draw cards and you use it to read for the person that you're reading with either yourself or another person. And the cards are filled with different symbols that, um, that represent my own spiritual ideas. And, uh, and I, use the, I use them, I use abstraction to sort of allow people to access their unconscious in different ways. I don't think you necessarily need to believe in the like, um, the divine or destiny to be able to get something from these cards, although it doesn't hurt. Uh, I think that um, it's just a, it, it can be a, a way to think about things that you wouldn't think about them otherwise. I, I can kind of go through some of the meanings of this card. So this is the star and um, there is a star in tarot if you know tarot as well, but this one is about um, sort of being in uh, like a special place, like a special in the starlight for um, for a moment that this is kind of like your time to shine. This is the wishbone and it's about uh, getting clear on your desires and the things that you want. This is the serpent and it's about um, opening yourself up to um, your own intuitive wisdom. This is the swarm, which is about uh, you, when this one pops up, it means that you're usually letting lots of little things distract you from your higher purpose. And all these were, these, so this is kind of a departure in that the, a lot of these are more object-based than the stuff you saw before. There's things in a lot of these images. And it was interesting to step away from abstraction and, and photograph more stuff. Um, and uh, this is the vortex, which is about being trapped in sort of an energy spiral, not being able to get out. This is the river. This is my Pittsburgh card. Um, when I moved out here, uh, I was so used to being around the ocean and kind of had to like adjust to having an attachment to a different bo different bodies of water with the rivers out here. And so um, I wanted to sort of note that in this deck. But what's interesting, what I really love about this image is that um, it looks like a river, but this is actually the ocean. And so it was a way to sort of combine the two things of like, coming to Pittsburgh, but leaving from the Bay Area. The river is about not trying to understand what's in, what's down the river, but trying to remain in the river that you're currently in, being present. 
This one is birth. This was the hardest card to make, un, uh, unsurprisingly perhaps, that um, is the last card that I shot for this deck. And this is obviously, it's a crystal, but it's a crystal within a crystal. And, uh, and it's about gestating new ideas and new things that will change you as you move, they move through you, literally or no. Um, I know there's a good deal of people in this audience tonight who have had readings from me. I do give readings with this deck. Um, and uh, uh, I really enjoy the experience of giving people readings with things that I've made um, and watching how uh, they open up to it and how they respond to it. And um, because one of the interesting and important things about reading cards is that it's a dialogue with the person you're reading. You don't just come down and tell them exactly what everything means. You ask them what they see um, and there's, and you give feedback to each other and things open up. And um, I don't use these cards to like tell the future. I'm not gonna be able to tell you if you're gonna win the lottery or get pregnant or anything like that. But uh, it's more about understanding the self and, uh, and opening yourself up to possibilities. I made this project because I, um, in, uh, I've heard of full disclosure, I am a witch. And I know witch, witches are like really cool right now. When I started being a witch, really not cool. And uh, and it was a really hard thing to sort of be out about and to be, um, to admit, especially when I was in grad school, because at the time when I was in grad school, it was like spirituality was not, at least in the environment I was in, it was not um, conducive to like academic art. And, but this was what was fueling my art from day one. And um, it was really, I was really afraid of um, doing something that was so blatantly about my spiritual experience. But this project really helped me to, um, to like come, come clean and to accept this. And the more honest and open I've been about it, the more people respond positively to me and my work. So it's almost like being yourself is a good thing. <laughs> So then I kind of, that was like my transition project um, between living in the Bay Area and, and moving here. And then I experienced my first ever Eastern winter, non-California winter, and um, it like blew my mind. <laughs> I was so unprepared. I didn't have snow boots. I didn't have a puffy coat. I didn't know why you would wear pants under your pants. Like I just, it didn't make sense to me and I had to learn. And I also had a residency at Vermont Studio Center in the month of January, so I really had to learn. And, um, but snow and ice became this thing that was so fascinating to me, but also so kind of disconcerting to me. And, uh, and so I, particularly when it started to melt or the ways that the sun reflected off of it. So, um, kind of enchanted by this new thing in my life, I started photographing the snow. It does not look like the snow. It's less important to me that you know what kind of snow it is or what it looked like beforehand. Um, it's just that this is waiting, that this is just there in the world and that if I look in the right way, I can find it. Let me consult my notes for a second. I know I'm forgetting something good. Okay. Um, so this was really like, this really felt like opening up a new world to me. Like I felt like there was something that was being shown to me um, that I needed to uh, capture and to show to others. And um, I don't imagine things beforehand when I'm shooting. I'm not like a, that's not how I work. I, I, I allow things to come to me instead. And, um, and yeah, I really feel like the way this, my work exists in the world is that it's meant for me to see, and then it's also meant for me to show to other people. And so that's how I really felt with these. These felt like um, a presence that uh, I could show other people. And I, this is around this time I started printing on fabric um, because it was a really great way to start printing very large. And also because it does this when it's in a space it exists, it really is present. And it responds to people's bodies when they're in the space too. So this was, this movement here was just from me walking by, or actually I had somebody else walk by, but um, it, it breathes, it lives when it's in, in relation to someone else. And um, 
So the photographic object started to become more prominent, which is funny because I had already made these photographic objects with the cards, but then this was really, became, it became important to me. Then I started getting weird about roses. So if you know me, you know that like I'm, I'm weird about roses, but I, uh, uh, so the snow melted and I kind of was at a loss of like, oh no, what do I do? And then uh, spring hit and spring hits here so intensely and vibrantly all of a sudden. And, um, and when the roses started blooming, uh, it became this thing that I couldn't, it felt like I was uh, like, like the actual definition of being enchanted, like that I was like under this kind of spell by them. And I'd had this experience before actually when I had lived in California, but it was even stronger here. And so I started photographing roses. So I, go, I went from this incredible abstraction to like this sort of object again and um, bouncing back and forth between the two feels kind of jarring to me, but also very exciting. So I just felt very compelled to photograph them. I didn't even fully understand why. I just felt like I had to. Um, the roses felt like, like they felt like they were calling me, which I know sounds a little wacky, but like I just couldn't stay away. And I kept coming back to them in different ways and in different states that they were blooming. And it felt like I needed to do something to sort of uh, honor them or to revere them. So lucky for me, I run my own gallery, and so I could. And so I made, um, I made basically an altar, of, like a temple space to roses. And um, I had this candle burning for uh, these candles. I think I burnt these candles for weeks beforehand, um, letting them melt in front of these roses that I had drying. Um, this is only part of the show, but um, what was, this was my favorite part of the show was that on one side of the gallery painted the, the wall pink and kind of had this altar type space. And then on the other, there was a mirror where um, that was from, I call it like baby's first found object piece. I uh, found this rose mirror uh, in a house that was being uh, demolished near my apartment. And, um, and I painted the wall that was like, all the mirror was flaking off and I painted the wall behind it pink so that when you walked in front of it, you could see the wall, pink wall behind you, and you would, could see yourself, and then you would disappear as you would move in front of the roses, um, which sort of felt like how I felt when I was seeing them. I just felt like I was like turning into them or becoming part of them. This, I know sounds like, I can't have, I don't have better words for this, and I'm, I'm fine with that at this point. Like, this was just like a thing I had to do. And so, yeah, so some more prints on fabric. And what was, again, I was working with the photographic object and trying to understand how I could take it off of the wall, how I could make it exist more in space. And so these weren't hanging on the wall. You can kind of see they're hanging in the middle of the gallery and they were two-sided, which to me as like, I had um, been trained as a very traditional photographer. I used to lug around a four by five camera and I used to like be very into very fine printing techniques and that kind of thing. Like making something that came off of the wall and was two-sided felt like, uh, revolutionary and so um, on one side of these images I know like it on one side of these images there were roses and on the other side were thorns this was based off of a these were from a dream that I had had it all felt very mystical this was one of the most intense hanging experiences I've ever had and also when the light was right you could see them both at the same time which I really love and it's something that I'm still experimenting with now to see what how layering the fabric can um, kind of create more to the narrative. And then it became winter again and all the roses died and I kind of was like, oh yeah, back to business, like back to like what I normally do. <laughs> and um, I had been offered a show at 707 Gallery and um, right around this time, this kind of pivot point. And uh, also there was a lot of changes in my personal life. And so I started thinking about um, this sort of triple aspect of change how there is you know there's a standard order to things and then some sort of intense event happens that disrupts that order and throws it into chaos um, only for a new order to be established and so uh so i was for this show that i i made i 
tried to make work that sort of represented all of those three aspects. So order, and this, this event, I started calling like the void event. Um, so order, the void event, and chaos, which ultimately resolves back into order again. Um, so I was, I felt like I needed to invoke that. I felt like societally we needed something like that too. And that um, this was you know, like at the beginning of 2020. Uh, and, uh, and so I was, I kind of created a space that meant, it was meant to uh, invoke this sort of change. And I'm very sorry, <laughs> very sorry I did that. <laughs> But so, and so here's a video that I made that was sort of a representation of like the void event moving through, uh, moving through order. I will not play all three minutes of it, but if you would like to watch all three minutes of it, let me know. I had this projected on the floor in the space. And uh, there was something about finding that on the ground at your feet instead of looking up or looking to the sides that felt um, very important to me. So yeah, so I printed more on fabric um, and I was kind of trying to represent this triple element here. This was chaos surrounded by voids and the other side is order surrounded by voids. And then there's voids happening at the bottom. There's that, the video. And then you can see there's these little, little prints off to the corners um, and I'm going to show you some documentation of these they're very strange but I want to apologize in advance for the quality of the documentation I had to document these in a real hurry because um, funny enough this show was uh, COVID happened in the middle of this show and so um, the cultural trust shut everything down um, understandably and the show ended up being up for uh, kind of kind of up for six months and then suddenly I got a call and they're like you need to take this show down this week and so I wasn't able to get uh, my normal person who comes in to document so with all of that here is what these little prints were doing I wanted something that existed in between a photograph and a video that sort of showed this transition between the two states This is called a lenticular print, and um, some of you may recognize it from Cracker Jack prizes or baseball cards, stickers maybe. Um, it's what's really amazing about this technique is that it actually has two photographs in it, and um, the way that they're spliced together and then a piece of plastic is put on top. Ooh, we're getting a little crunchy on the video there, but I think you saw the first one's okay. Uh, video, you never know, is on Zoom. Um, but you, there's this piece of plastic that's laid on top that actually you can kind of see it here in this video that has these lines that run through it. And depending on the angle of the light, it will either show you one or the other image, which is really cool to think that there's like two photos hidden in, they only, you can only kind of view one at a time. So this brings me to now and um, what I've been working on most recently. And uh, this was all like lockdown work. Um, and so it's still in process in my mind, but it still feels interesting. And so I wanted to show it to everyone. I, um, before all of this happened, I was lucky enough to have a, um, a fellowship with the Pittsburgh Glass Center, their idea furnace program, where they paired me with um, some glass technicians that helped me make objects to photograph. And this was so exciting to me and is something I want to continue to explore when it's safe to do so. Um, but making these objects and being fully in control of what it was that I was going to be photographing, but not knowing necessarily how, what was going to come through these, these objects um, was really amazing and generative. And I made some work that uh, was very intense. Um, here's some more voids showing up, but I, I started out, I, I was, um, I was really working with color uh, and um, I was staying with my boyfriend who has this home that uh, has like beautiful light in it everywhere. And um, I, I was like, I'm going to try to make some soothing images right now because everything's very stressful and I just couldn't. <laughs> Instead, I made things like this that feel very intense. Um, I don't know if they feel as intense to you, but they, I look at them and I feel just like, I don't know, they just feel very, very intense to me. Um, they feel very unrelenting is the word that I feel.
And it's really great. All of these are from these um, funny little glass plates that I made uh, at the glass center. I'm, I made some with a glass blower and I made some um, just in a kiln, glass fusing. Like, right, you would think kind of on its on, on surface that this one would be pretty soothing, right? But then you look at it more, I don't know, for me, I look at it more and I, and I get like um, those orbs from The Prisoner, if anyone's ever seen The Prisoner, or it just feels like this looming, ominous presence instead that's maybe sort of guised in this sweet, rainbowy light. Um, some of this work I ended up showing at, uh, oh, this is a video. So some of this work I ended up showing at the um, brew house. So this this piece felt pretty emblematic of the time. It's this, it like is this void that's sort of cycling around and there's all this light, Is a, but it's like, is the light being sucked into it? Is the light coming out of it? Is it both? There's, it feels like this both, it's like a very soothing thing, but also a very destructive thing at the same time. But the liquid quality of the glass uh, was something that was very exciting to me. Like I was looking through some notes while I was putting together this slideshow and like when I was writing about this, it was like my note that is like, is there room for hope right now? That's what this feels like in a way to me is like, is this, can I, can I choose how I view it? Is it destructive or is it not destructive? Can I allow myself to even think that it could be not destructive? So yeah, so I put some of this work up at the Seeking Truth exhibition at the Brew House, which is the culmination of um, a year-long residency there. And um, it uh, that was a weird one. We all had a weird time with that because halfway through our residency, we suddenly, we couldn't access our, I mean, we were like given kind of heads up and were able to move out, but we weren't really able to access our studios and then slowly we were able to again. But um, putting up a show during the pandemic was very interesting. The Brew House was great. They um, like Natalie and Stephanie were so supportive and um, and they did a great job of creating a really safe environment for people to come through. But it was also just very strange hanging a show during a pandemic, uh, coming and seeing the work, coming and seeing my own work that I had made during this time out of time that didn't, that felt so intense to me. This work, I, um, I call it, like I titled these three pieces, uh, Eclipse Season because I was thinking of uh, if anyone is uh, ast astrologically inclined, um, uh, excuse me, yes, astrologically inclined, uh, that eclipse season is usually this time of intense change. And it's usually very uncomfortable change. It's usually upheaval and, um, and resistant, resisting change. And so um, it definitely felt like we were all kind of being forced through stuff maybe we didn't necessarily want but needed to experience during that time, whether or not we thought it was caused by the sun and moon or not. So to wrap up this talk, um, this is a picture of the moon that I took myself. This is what I'm, um, uh, kind of doing right now is instead of trying to, I'm kind of giving myself a breather of um, 
making work instead I'm trying to learn a new skill with my photographs and I'm um, learning astrophotography so uh, I hooked up my camera to a telescope and I took this picture of the moon which I am like I'm still stunned every time I see it they're like I took that picture um, which I haven't had that experience in a very long time of learning something new and kind of being able to figure it out and um, I don't know exactly how this is going to turn up in my work yet I have no doubt that it will um, but uh, it feels like a natural extension of the things that I've made before is to learn this skill and to see maybe like, how could I, what would photographing the moon with my magic lens look like? Or what would combining these images with other images, the more abstracted images, what would that look like? So um, that's where I'll leave it for today. And here's how you can get a hold of me if you ever want to get a hold of me. There's my website and my, you know, my email address and my Instagram. Um, so yeah, I guess we can open it up for questions and stuff now. Thank you so much, Sensa. Um, everyone is able to unmute themselves. So if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and let them roll. Hi, Senta. Hey. It's beautiful. Hello. I, Thank you. Because um, I don't think I've actually seen that much of your work, so it's really great to actually get to see it. Um, this is kind of a half-formed question, so hopefully it'll be fully formed by the time I'm done asking it. I see Celeste laughing already um, question okay <laughs> um yeah i was wondering how like the role of additions um interacts with the nature of your work um because um i feel like photography is often talked about in relation to the photographic print you're not just printing this one photo you're printing it many many times there's this sort of like numbering and signing process and um, just from the framing of your work here, it seems more fo focused on like um, sort of like a singular image versus an addition. And I was wondering um, any, any particular reasons you have for maybe like seemingly not really engaging with additions or any speculation about what would happen um, if you were to engage more with additions, and of course, I just remembered that your tarot, that not your tarot, your oracle deck is kind of like a photographic edition. So that's mm -hmm. an example of you engaging with it. So yeah. Yeah, that, that project naturally lent itself to being in additions, um, but I primarily don't because it feels like um, uh, capitalist false scarcity. <laughs> I mean, with digital photographs, what's the point of an edition? You can print a thousand. Um, and uh, if, you're, if your set settings on the printer are the same, you can print a thousand and they're all the same. Um, uh, I, that's different if you're a printmaker or if you're printing in a dark room even, but if you're printing digitally and especially if you're sending it to labs and stuff, um, that part has always felt sort of goofy to me. Also because I'm working with these big objects, you're right, like these kind of singular images and, and then they do become um, unique objects because I do all of the uh, fabric prints I sew myself. So I'm not like, even if they're vaguely different, they're never going to be the same twice. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Hey, Santa, this is Sarah. Hey. I'm here, hi. Yeah, good <laughs> I have to see questions. you. Um, yeah. First, I have one comment. Um, I love the roses, the really desaturated roses with the glowing edges. They seemed like they vibrated. And a couple of the other pieces seemed like they vibrated too visually, which was really interesting. Um, but I've got um, two questions. One is about um, what you're gonna do next with the astral photography. It seems like a very interesting vein. And then second, second question is about your curating practice. I've been to a couple of your shows and I've, thought that they were some of the most avant-garde in Pittsburgh. And it's surprising to see that in Pittsburgh, but also in Wilkinsburg. So like, how did that happen and what's your curatorial style? Cool, thank you. What a great compliment. Um, so uh, yeah, for astrophotography, my goal is to take a photo of the Milky Way is my next like technical goal because it's really hard. Um, but I, what I am thinking is some kind of, with the layering of the prints that I had been like minorly experimenting before, I was the kind of what I'm initially thinking might be a way to take this is to kind of layer sort of the real with the unreal and see how that works out. But yeah, all of that is very, very, very fresh. So we'll see what happens with that. But as for my curatorial practice, um, I 
wanted to show weird stuff and I wanted to show things that excited me and that um, that maybe wouldn't be able to be shown in many other places because for me in some ways the stakes were low I wasn't planning on making any money the apart the galleries attached to my apartment um, like there's no no need to recoup any costs or anything like that and so it was just like let's just do the thing that you're excited about that's what makes me excited so so my um and then and then of course there's like things that i like but but the things that i like like the uh you know are so wide and varied that i don't know if there's a thread beyond i um connected with artists who had um the kind of excited energy that i wanted to show I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, your photographs and like your work, like your lens based work is so visually stunning. But while I was like looking at your slideshow, I felt like there was like a big like audio like capability or like an audio aspect that could be explored. I was wondering if you've ever thought about like branching into like more like, like audio. And I was even thinking like VR somehow, like how that would be able to be integrated. I have no idea. But like, I was just wondering like, if that's ever been like a uh, thought of yours if anyone knows how to do vr stuff get a hold of me i would love to do that <laughs> but um but yeah i have in the past actually worked with audio uh when i was doing i didn't really include it in this show because it was just kind of too much but before i moved out here i was doing a lot more installation stuff and um so it would be videos projected often onto fabric and um and there would usually be an audio component with it and i worked often with archival audio um i've worked a lot with uh nasa has a bunch of audio recordings they nasa has a sound cloud and it's all it's all um creative commons because we taxpayers paid for it and so it's like high quality audio that um you can download and manipulate and and most of the audio i've done has been um uh manipulations of the Voyager Golden Record and other audio that has been taken of like um, there were some of the moons of Saturn and also like um, like electrical storms in Jupiter things like that that I kind of combined together. Um, my my graduate thesis had um, uh, it was a bunch of like I I ran a bunch of crystal balls over the hum of the uh, USS Enterprise, like from uh, Next Generation. So it had this like dull hum throughout the whole gallery. That was really great. Um, yes, so yes, I have done audio and I haven't done it in a long time. And, um, but it's something I do still think about. There's a narrow line that I don't wanna cross where it becomes like, uh, I don't know, like a music show. Um, and I don't want it to be that, which I don't think I've actually ever come close to that, but I don't want to go there because that doesn't feel like, I feel like the audio is, a, for me, a, a gentle support as opposed to the main focus. I also had another question. Um, it has to do with your Oracle deck. Um, I think I asked this to you before when I had a reading with you at that really strange event at the museum like a year ago. <laughs> yes, that was weird. It was great. Um, but I I wanted to ask like um, if you've ever like do you ever do readings like where you combine like other like decks as well like other like if you throw like other artist decks or just like the traditional tarot deck and stuff like if that hasn't been up until recently, hadn't been part of my practice, but it has been very, very recently working its way in. I started, tr I took a 13 week training with uh, Pittsburgh's, one of Pittsburgh's best tarot readers. If anyone knows Ruth and Sharkey, I was lucky enough to be able to train with them, take a class with them. And um, they do this, they have techniques where they use multiple decks and open things up. And, and so I've been trying to be like, okay, how can I use how can I either open things up with my deck because it's a sim simple system I know, like it is it is me, so I know it so well, um, or how can I or vice versa? And um, it has been interesting to see those two to see the like traditional Rider Waite Coleman Smith deck in conversation with my deck has been um, interesting, very cool, yeah.
Hey, I, I thought hey. I heard someone. Can yeah. Hi, it's Stephanie. Oh, hey. Hi. Um, I am curious, those early ones of like the space crystals that you mm -hmm. did um, in the Bay Area. Oh my God, you're kidding. Yes, I know. <laughs> that was very much a surprise. Hi, Gloria. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm curious about the cropping of those images because it looked like they were all very portrait oriented and mm -hmm. like skinny, like phone, even phone format. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of curious about how that's, how cropping and orientation has changed over your practice. Yeah, I, um, that they were, they were, it was, um, it's funny, it was like an aspect ratio um, thing that I, I was, I was like, these are, there's like maybe a, one or two horizontal images in the, the set I showed you. I originally conceived of it as all vertical. For some reason, I was like, up and down is like space. And so I, but then I, I eventually c shot a couple that were like, that were horizontal. And I was like, okay, they kind of have to be included, but they do feel like they have a different energy than those. those. And yeah, that like narrower aspect ratio was, it was like this kind of like upward, ener upward energy that, um, that was, thank you for noticing that. And I hadn't actually thought about that in a long time that I had this like weird thing for a long time where I was like, I only shoot vertical images, like, which I'm gonna kind of move past. Um, I do have another question too. Um, uh, my partner Dave is interested in the lens, that your magic lens that you made. Mm -hmm. Oh, there he is. Um, <laughs> and he's curious about like, like how did you, like, cause you said you've used the same one for over a decade. So have you made changes to it? How did you know that they would go together that way? And like, how, did, I mean, I know you got all these extra lenses cause they were cheap, but like, how did you do that? Yeah, I originally did this because my friend in undergrad let me borrow um, a 80 millimeter macro lens and he let me borrow it for like a year and I was like, oh, maybe he forgot that he let me borrow it and he'll just never ask for it back. And then he did and I was like, I was kind of devastated because I had been so fascinated by it. And so I went to a store and was like, how much are those? And they were like $800. And I was like, great. So I can't get that. So what can I do to make macro images? And this guy like sold me, he was like, well, do you shoot film? And I was like, yes, I still shoot film. And he handed me this little like macro extender. And he's like, you can stick this onto any lens and it will give you okay macro images. And so then I was, and he kind of showed me like, there's these ways to like, you can buy these adapter rings and attach things. And then I was just like, oh, well, what if I add this? What if I add that? And I started messing around. So instead of getting a macro, well, I got my macro lens, but I got a very weird one. So it was mostly trial and error. And one time I was giving a talk, what this is why I almost like one of the reasons why I don't, um, like I don't usually show it. Well, I was giving a talk and I was trying to be like fancy and I like took it all apart. And then I took it apart and was like, oh no, how do I put it back together? And um, I did eventually get it back together, but it actually took me a while. <laughs> I do sometimes experiment with other stuff too, but um, I, it's not, this is, but this is like 90% of how I work is with this thing because it's always, it has so much in it that is constantly showing itself to me. Um, hey, Santa. Hello. <laughs> um, lovely to hear you talk about your work. Mm -hmm. um, also to hear you um, talk about how your Oracle deck is, is kind of, you know, and your tarot practices are infusing one another because that is something that I have found with your Oracle deck has uh, been like this really incredible kind of amplification of my my whole, um, you know, Oracle kind of practice. Um, but really what I want to know is how does it feel to be photographing actual outer space now like just what is that what is that experience like for you it's so exciting it is so moving to me um when we were when we were out there shooting the moon uh it like i don't know i like almost wanted to cry like i was like hopping around so excited i like spilled wine on myself i like was just so like be it was like i just i was like that's I'm bringing it closer to me, I think is how I felt. And, um, and, 
uh, yeah, it's, there's just this overwhelming joy that I feel when I see it and I'm able to look at these things. And I really love to imagine what it was like for like Galileo when Galileo saw the moons of Jupiter for the first time and stuff and like how, and it's just so amazing. Uh, we were camping when we, I took that picture of the moon and um, some of the people who were camping next to us, we like invited them over to come and see it. And they were all really excited about it too. And there's just this, I don't know, this, we can't get out there for the most part. None of us will be able to get out there and see those things. So this is the next best thing is that we still have access to it in some way and that it's just there. It's just without us, it's there being so beautiful and we have nothing to do with it. And maybe that's why it's so great too, is that we can see it, we can't touch it and we can't mess it up. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much, the most. Do you have any other questions from the floor at all? If you don't want to talk, we also have our chat box open so you can like type it if you want, but also no pressure. All right, well, it seems like um, there are no more questions, but I do have one final question for you, Santa, which is what can we do to support you through this ridiculous pandemic time? Like, are you doing virtual readings? Like, what, how are ways that we can offer you um, support and like love? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, that's very sweet. I, um, I don't, I don't officially do virtual readings, but if anyone ever like reached out to me and wanted a reading, I would love to give them one. And maybe it is something I should maybe start doing more officially. Um, but uh, I also have my deck for sale and you can find that through my website. And I also have a couple prints for sale too um, right now. Uh, it's sort of a COVID relief fund for me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you want a reading, I would love to give you a reading. We can work something out to everybody who's who's listening because I haven't given readings in a while and um, I gave one recently and it was uh, and I was like oh yeah I like this like this is this is part of my practice it's a way of working with my work with other people and um, it feels like a really good way to do that. Thanks well thank you everyone and thank you so much Santa for joining us tonight and for being a wonderful presenter um, before our last collaborative tiny talk. Um, so MS Mama right now, we have Santa's work available. Some like beautiful fabric prints of hers are here at the shop. We're open Friday through Sunday, 11 to 4 p.m. And I just wanna give y'all a little heads up on a couple more events we have on the docket. So next Wednesday, I believe we have two events. One is photo fair related and one is Mama related. So the photo fair related one is the collector show and tell, which is basically like a rapid fire like presentation where people of um, all different backgrounds, like all different like um, like experiences in terms of collecting, in terms of like in terms of like their enjoyment of photography, are able to showcase a piece from their collection and talk about why they love it in three minutes or less. So that's a free event, and if you want to sign up for that, that's on the photo fair website. And then next after that, actually at 8 p.m., we have a artist talk from Darren Milner, who I mentioned earlier and is our current resident artist. And you can find a link to sign up on the Small Mall website. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much, Santa. That was really beautiful. Thank and thank you. you again, everyone, for coming and making this final collaborative talk so wonderful. <laughs> uh, so many people came. This is great. Um, so with that, I'd like to conclude and I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Yeah, thank, thank you so much everyone for coming. This was really lovely. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you.